start our recording. Fantastic. So this series uh, is being sponsored by LEAF. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with LEAF, uh, LEAF is a partnership between the Wisconsin DNR Division of Forestry and the Wisconsin Center for Environmental Education here at UW-Stevens Point. And our main mission is to connect formal and non-formal, <clears throat> excuse me, educators in Wisconsin with quality forest education materials, which is what we're bringing to you today. Um, my name is Gretchen Marshall. I am on uh, staff here with LEAF and my main focus is helping uh, coordinate and support the school forest program in Wisconsin. We do have some other LEAF staff members um, on the session here as well. If you wanna quickly unmute yourself and show us your faces through the video, maybe gave a little wave and a, a hello, that would be fantastic. So Steve Schmidt, I see you're on. Hi, I'm Steve Schmidt. I've uh, worked for LEAF for the last couple of years and I'm pleased to be here to listen to Logan's presentation. And let's see, Kate. Yep, I'm here. Sorry, I'm doing some cat things. And so I'm here and I've worked uh, with LEAF the last uh, year and a half, two years. And um, I'm also super excited for Logan's presentation. And did I see anybody else jump on for LEAF? Oh, Jamie, you want to say hi? Hi. <laughs> uh, for those of you who received your confirmation emails uh, and Zoom links for today, Jamie is the one that uh, helps with all of our registration behind the scenes and makes that all possible. So thank you, Jamie, uh, for coordinating all of that. Um, with that, just really quickly, again, for those that are not familiar with LEAF, uh, how do we help educators in the state to get that professional um, forestry and, uh, information that they need and information about Wisconsin's forests so that they can uh, deliver those educational lessons and components to the students. We do that through professional development. Um, back uh, when we were able to, to travel, we did a lot of uh, in-person, in-service training and workshops, but now we're bringing you those online options. We have curriculum materials available, uh, hands-on forestry education kits, and we do provide support for uh, outdoor classrooms through the School Forest Program and Project Learning Tree. So if you ever have questions, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out and contact one of us. And with that, I am not going to waste any more time and turn it over to Logan. Um, I will let him give a much more thorough introduction of himself because he has such a varied and diverse background. And uh, just preparing for today's uh, session, I'm super excited to learn more myself about our forest products in Wisconsin. So with that, Logan, would you like to take it away? You betcha. Hi, I'm Logan. I'm also excited for Logan's presentation today. Um, but no, I really am. So we'll get this shared and hopefully things will get fired up. So. Can folks see my screen? Yes, we can. Good deal. Well, uh, the, thank you very much for having me. And I'm super excited to talk about uh, celebrating Wisconsin's forest products. That uh, title of celebrating, I think is really fitting uh, because of Forest Products Week coming up here at the end of the month. So uh, without further ado, um, a little bit about myself before we get started. I grew up in Southern Wisconsin. Uh, Monroe High School is where I graduated from. And I was really active in the FFA and uh, a lot of other extracurriculars, uh, extracurricular activities, um, but FFA was my favorite by far. And, and the top right, um, this is a picture of my FFA project where I actually started a portable sawmill business uh, to learn about the lumber industry and forestry. I would cut logs into lumber for whether it's farmers making barn boards and fence posts or uh, woodworkers, et cetera. So that was kind of how I got started. Um, I attended UW-Madison um, so I'm a very proud Badger alumni. Um, this is actually a picture of myself and a friend at the national championship game uh, when the Badgers beat Kentucky um, and then lost to Duke, but we don't talk about that game because Kentucky won. Um, but anyway, so proud Badger alumni. And then from there, I went to Purdue University um, and got a master's in wood products. Um, the research project I was working with was looking at lumber grading um, and specifically hardwood lumber grading. So 
we can talk about that later if there's questions. But from there, with that background, I got a job uh, working for a hardwood sawmill out of Reesburg, Wisconsin, um, as kind of a quality control production foreman type job. Um, it was an amazing learning opportunity and I really enjoyed it. Uh, but then I had the opportunity to apply to this position. Um, so I work with the Wisconsin DNR's forest products team. I've been with this team for about a year and a half, not uh, about a year and a half. And uh, it's been a real joy and treat to get to know all the different industry sectors in the state um, and share that with you. So again, our program that I work for is called the Forest Product Services. And we provide technical assistance, training and outreach to different forest businesses in the state. So we're kind of like a consultant that is able to help industry with certain challenges um, and really be kind of that extra employee that they need to get some of these bigger challenges uh, or work on them together. So you might've heard the term utilization and marketing before. Um, that's kind of how we fall into the DNR and the Division of Forestry. It's all about utilizing the timber we grow um, and how can we market those products to, uh, to make things. There are four of my positions across the state. Um, there's a gentleman in uh, Green Bay called Scott Lyon, who you might've worked with before. Um, another out of Madison named Sabina Dugana, and then another out of Rhinelander named Alex Anderson. So, uh, and then I'm out of Hayward, Wisconsin. So I'm kind of responsible for the Northwest corner of the state. Um, so, and without going any further, I just want to say thank you uh, to all the teachers on the talk today. I uh, we're all going through tough challenges with COVID, no doubt. But when I think about what teachers are doing right now and students, uh, truly amazing at the hard work um, with rolling with it and trying to make the most. And uh, you truly do change students' lives. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that you do. So know that your work doesn't go unnoticed. So now let's get into the, the celebration. We've got a little roadmap. Uh, first, we're gonna talk about the benefits of forests. And then we're going to go into some specific Wisconsin forest products. Um, finally, we'll go through some specific key messages that we can take from this talk and share that with students and share that with other people we meet to celebrate forest products. And then I guess the last thing, we'll talk about some other career resources and open it up for some questions on the industry that you all might have. So the first question, what benefits do forest entries provide? Go ahead and maybe think to yourself, and I'm trying to make this as interactive as possible. Uh, go ahead and maybe think for 10 seconds or comment in the chat, what are some benefits that, that forests provide in trees? So this first picture kind of alludes to recreational opportunities, but what are some other ones? I can actually see the chat um, with this set up. So it'll be kind of a rhetorical question, but who for thought? Give me a couple seconds. So hopefully we've kind of gathered some of the benefits in our mind, and there's a lot to think about for benefits that trees provide us. One is recreational opportunities. Another would be wildlife habitat, right? And, and that environment that uh, animals, birds, and insects need. Another would be, uh, you know, stormwater runoff, cleaning our, filtering our waters. Forests acts as sponge, and they're able to help clean both our water and our oxygen, our air that we breathe. And then forest products, uh, which we'll talk about most today. So these can all be summarized as ecosystem services, as I'm sure many of you have heard that term before, but these are the positive benefits of natural resources. There's four categories, um, cultural, supporting, and regulating. And we won't dive into them too much, uh, but it's important to note that forest products are, it's a good that we harvest from the, from the forest, but it's only one part of the benefits that we provide. The whole purpose of this slide is really to just set the table and understand that when we talk about forest products, that's just one of the many benefits we have from trees. So provisioning services, what are those? We've got two types that we're gonna talk a little bit about. The first would be non-timber forest products and then timber forest products. So when we say a non-timber forest product, that would be things like sap that we would boil down to make uh, syrup. I'm sure many of us uh, enjoy that part of spring. Morel mushrooms, if we've got any morel uh, mushroom hunters or perhaps ginseng. Um, these are, are goods that we harvest from the forest um, and resources we extract. 
but it's not really a timber forest product. Timber forest products refer to anything when we harvest a tree, a tree itself, and that, and that wood fiber, what that gets turned into are all forest products. So that tree, whether it's being turned into notebooks or studs for houses um, or musical instruments, these are all different forest products uh, that fall under that provisioning ecosystem service. So the next question is, how are forest products connected to forest management? I'm sure many of us have heard of the ecosystems being described as a food web, where all of our insects, birds, and animals are connected to each other. But that web extends even further, right? And our plants are part of that, our trees, um, are related to the habitat, that the wildlife and the environment, uh, as well as the climate and our homes and our businesses. It's all connected into one web, and sometimes we might forget to look at it all. But what's really important here is that each of us as consumers has an impact on these web. Maybe not so much in a direct way, but in indirect ways that we don't necessarily understand. Uh, one lesson that really stuck with me was uh, the pillars of sustainability from high school. Um, and so in order for something to be truly sustainable, we have to have three pillars in place. The first is a social acceptance. Something must, in order for an action or any decision to be truly sustainable, it has to be viewed as morally acceptable by our society. The next is the environmental sustainability. So this one is probably what comes to mind first and foremost when we talk, first and foremost, when we talk about sustainability, but um, just understanding that we can't jeopardize the health of our future environment if, if something is gonna be sustainable in the long run. And then the final pillar that sometimes gets forgotten is the economic pillar. In order for a decision or action to truly be sustainable in the long term, we have to have profit. It has to make economic sense, meaning the numbers have to add up and there has to be uh, economic incentive or uh, profit, essentially. So these three pillars, maybe some of us have described them as the three P's of sustainability with people, planet, and profit. Um, but it, you gotta have all three in order for something to be truly sustainable. So sustainable forestry, depends on all those. And we're going to talk about this economic pillar here um, and how we can strengthen that as consumers. So that was a little bit about the benefits of the forest. Gretchen, I guess, are there any questions that have come up um, yet so far or anything that I can address with those? And no, one... you're good. Keep going. It's looking great. Awesome. Uh, well, now we'll jump into some of those specific Wisconsin forest products. So kind of another food for thought question. Uh, again, I wish we could do this in person and we could, uh, could really talk it out, but go ahead and think for yourself, what factors determine the type of finished product or products that a baby tree becomes? So we've got three little pictures of baby trees here. How do we know what that tree will grow up to be um, as an eventual product? And I can't really see the chat, but if folks do wanna chime in there, go ahead and, and and flag me down. If I'm talking too fast, I can also slow down too. I know I outrun my internet sometimes. <laughs> well, some of those factors that we'll talk about uh, include the species. So certain trees make different products based on their species, but then also the quality. Um, and so whether our tree, this baby tree grows up to become toilet paper or firewood or a a uh, chair or piano or two by four, it depends on, on the, the species of tree, the quality and size of the tree. So does it have a lot of knots? Is it straight? Is it crooked? Um, as well as the location on where that tree is growing and what markets are in that area, what kinds of businesses are around. Um, hey, um, I just wanted to interrupt, Logan, there was a question on the size of the tree and then the type of wood and density and grain. Um, Was that a comment, Kate, or? Uh, it's from Colin and Mark. So if, if you all want to unmute yourselves and add in, that's cool. Oh, I was just trying to participate. This is Mark and uh, just throw out some characteristics that affect how wood can be used. Yeah, bingo, Mark, You thank you very much for the participation. It's tough because I can't see the, the actual chat box going on right here, but no, that you laid out 
three or four really good characteristics um, that impact what the what the tree will become eventually as a product. So kind of to build on that, when we're when we grow a forest, we're not just growing one specific type of tree. There are plantations, but even within a plantation, you have different products that are harvested. So we're going to call these raw product classes: um, pulpwood, bolts, saw logs, and veneer specialty logs. Now, what differentiates these is mostly the size. So bolts and pulpwood are going to be smaller than saw logs, but then also the quality. So for instance, if we look at this tree right here, I don't know if you can see uh, my laser pointer, but there's no knots. It's a, small, it's a small diameter tree, but there's no knots or branches. And so it's a higher quality than this upper portion of the tree where we might have more branches and defects. So we can use clear wood for higher value products than we use what the defects or smaller products are. That's a really important point to make that we always try and use the highest and best use of that piece of wood that we're harvesting from the forest. And then they become different finished, finished markets or products. So whether it's biomass or firewood, pulp for making paper, um, engineered wood products, lumber, whether it's softwood or hardwood, depends on the species again. Um, and then other specialty products. And we'll go into each of these different market sectors and some specific companies and products that they're making. But unfortunately, it's not a simple translation. I know this web kind of gets confusing here, but the point of that animation is to show that uh, even though it's a pulpwood, a pulpwood harvested in Marathon County would go somewhere completely different or make a different product than in uh, say uh, Sawyer County. And again, that's species and, and all dependent. So, and even within the log, we'll talk about uh, just, it's a complex matrix and markets are always changing and very dynamic. So we're gonna start with our biggest sector. Um, this is pulp. So for those of us who haven't seen what pulp looks like before, think of it kind of like bales of cotton. Um, and so wood, when we harvest a tree, we've got three big components. We've got cellulose and hemicellulose and then lignin. You can kind of think of it like a plate of spaghetti where lignin is the sauce and the cellulose and hemicellulose are the long strands and the spaghetti uh, pieces. And so what pulp mills do is it's like organic chemistry on steroids. Like this is the industry for organic chemistry. Um, and so this molecule, the way these, uh, the pulp is produced is uh, through a couple different processes in the state. Um, and we've got eight different pulp mills and they're using a couple different methods, um, but a lot of times that lignin, the byproduct, so we've got the pulp, the cellulose, the hemicellulose, the lignin, that byproduct becomes a lot of different chemicals um, and natural sugars that we use. So if you've ever heard of xylitol, um, that's the sugar that's in Trident gum, um, and it doesn't rot your teeth, and it's a, a special organic molecule. I'm not a chemist by any means, um, but it's just a really cool alternative product that we don't necessarily think of uh, that's coming from the pulp sector. So here are some of the companies, the pulp mills that we have in the state. Um, and uh, yeah, are there any questions on the pulp mills? Most of them are central to, or uh, in central Wisconsin. And we've actually had a current event go on with a Verso mill in Rapids. So this is something looking back when I was in school at the time, I maybe didn't appreciate it enough, uh, but current events and understanding what's going on outside of my classes, outside of my local community, uh, that has a big impact. And so this past summer, um, there was a pulp and paper mill in Wisconsin that announced it was gonna stop production um, and idle indefinitely. And that was the Wisconsin Rapids pulp and paper mill. Um, so again, June 9th, uh, Bristol Corporation announced that indefinite idling um, of not only the rapids, but their Duluth facilities. And, and the reason this is such a big deal is because they consumed 1.5 million tons of wood a year as a huge amount of wood. To put that in perspective, per day, they would use about over 150 truckloads of wood. So just imagine uh, semi-trucks, 150 of them being consumed each day 
uh, by that facility. It was Wisconsin's largest uh, wood using facility in the state. And there's over 900 jobs at the Wisconsin Rapids facility, um, as well as over 500 timber suppliers. So loggers and truckers that are helping to feed that mill. That's just for the direct jobs and suppliers. Then when you think about the waves on the supply chain and the local community, all the other jobs that are supported um, through that, it's really a, been a devastating event. Um, and we're scrambling to hopefully be able to reopen it under new ownership. Um, but it's, it's really been an important current event people should understand. And uh, yeah, because it also impacts our schools when we think about uh, when we're not using that much wood, we've got an oversupply of, of wood in the state and pulp wood specifically is what this mill would be using. And so with that oversupply of pulp wood, we see a big drop in the value and then pulp wood can't be sold. And so landowners, uh, forest landowners can't sell their timber or it's worth less. Um, and we see this on our county forest lands um, where they're harvesting timber to pay for things like schools and roads and local government. And without the revenue from these timber sales um, or a reduced revenue, it really impacts their local budget. So we won't go into that too much unless folks have questions, but this is a, a current event that uh, feel free to have students look up uh, or understand. So just to dive into the paper categories, um, the first we're talking about graphic uh, papers. So we think about, and this kind of leads to why that Verso mill was announced its closure was because of a decline in markets due to COVID, um, as well as just the general market trend. They made a lot of graphic paper at that facility. So we think about all the schools and businesses that have closed um, because nobody's using white copy paper. But then there's other grades or products that we use. So for instance, if you've ever been to a brewer game or a sports game, um, those programs are made on that heavy glossy paper that's another type of graphic paper that that mill would have produced. Um, and because again, there's no uh, sports going on, people aren't buying programs, as well as things like travel brochures and other magazines. Um, so those would be a graphic paper category. So that's one paper category, but there's uh, three other ones we'll talk about that are really exciting. Uh, the next is packaging. So the packaging grades of paper, we all know about Amazon and the boxes and, and shipping. That's really encouraging and exciting. And we have companies that make those, uh, that grade of packaging paper in Wisconsin. But then some other really cool examples include uh, paper bottles. So I don't know if folks have been uh, watching, uh, both Coca-Cola and Pepsi have announced um, trying to launch paper bottles in 2021. And that's really exciting. Uh, because that's a consumer driven change. Uh, we know the dangers and the hazards of plastics in our oceans and single use plastics like soda bottles are really, uh, it's not sustainable. And so this is a, a recyclable, renewable alternative solution that's coming online. Same thing with this keel clip. So it's meant to replace the, uh, um, the plastic rings that you see on six packs of cans and things like that. So Packaging is a growing area of the paper sector um, and very exciting. But then tissue, that's another example of a, a category of paper. So whether it's facial tissues or toilet paper or diapers, um, very important paper category that we use every day. Um, and then specialty items. So things like candy wrappers, um, this is what's called release paper. Um, so when you have like a sticky note or a, excuse me, not a sticky note, but a name tag, that there's the name tag that's on the sticker and then that specialty paper that it peels off from, that's a, a really unique product that we make here in Wisconsin with some of our companies. So, and then medical uh, face masks, things like that, medical gowns. So um, these are all different paper sectors. Um, and we really do have one of the most diverse and thriving paper industries in the world. And we are the leader in the US. So that's very exciting. We're the number one paper manufacturing state in the country. We've got 35 paper mills. So if you can see this picture, um, most are centered in the Fox Valley area, um, but then we do have some others scattered throughout the state. Um, these are some of those companies, um, but what else is really exciting is we have over 200 other paper remanufacturers. So they're taking rolls of paper and turning them into finished products, whether that's displays at grocery stores 
um, box plants where they're making actual boxes. And so paper is a very exciting industry and it's a good use of our forest resources here in the state. Any questions on the paper? I know I kind of skipped through that and I, I hope I'm not running out of time or going too long. I can uh, keep her moving here going if we're running out of time. Yeah, Logan, we, we do have, um, and just so you know, for time wise, we are at uh, 1228 already. And I know you have a lot of other things you want to get through, but it's really good information. So I'll just let you think through that. But Steve did have a question about biomass plants, like uh, the one at like Domtar's facility in Rothschild. Can they take some of the excess pulp wood or not? That's a really good question. And so when we say biomass, uh, that can be any type of biological material. So uh, what typically happens is we want to use pulp wood to make the highest value product. And you, burning just wood for energy, um, it's a good use, but it's not the highest value. And so making pulp uh, for paper would be a higher value product. Um, so to answer your question, uh, no, typically the biomass would be using uh, things like bark or other wood residues. It could use pulp wood, but typically that's going to go to a higher value market. Um, and then the other thing right now, and we'll get to the biomass sector, is natural gas. Uh, with prices being low for that, it makes it really hard uh, for biomass energy to, to pencil out with the numbers. So. Yeah, that's a great question, and, and we can definitely dive into that more if folks have questions. I have a biomass elevator pitch I love to share because there's a lot of misconceptions about that. So if we have time, we'll get to that for sure. So, uh, but pellet mills. So I wanted to touch on this. Uh, pellet mills. So when we talk wood pellets, we hear a lot about like Drax Energy and the UK and uh, export pellets to Japan and Europe for energy. And that's really exciting. Most of our pellet mills are not making, are, are, we don't have mills, pellet mills in Wisconsin that are exporting overseas for energy markets. Um, they are making heating pellets, but it's mainly for the domestic heating, residential heating here in state um, and locally, not abroad. Uh, but what's exciting and a growing trend is uh, smoking and barbecue pellets. So this is a niche that is growing, um, but we've all seen uh, the pellet grills and smokers uh, this is a growing market that a lot of our companies are really uh, exploring and doing well with. So um, again, using wood to, for culinary purposes isn't new, but these pellets are allowing more people to access them and it's a great market for us. So wood pellets, uh, not only for home heating, but more so for cooking. So again, the biomass plant, we have uh, three facilities in the state that are using biomass. Um, up in Ashland is the Excel Energy plant. Um, and then we've got the Rothschild We Energies plant that was announced. And then uh, Gunnarsson Lutheran in La Crosse there uh, at the hospital, I believe. Or no, that's a different one. Um, French Island, I think. Yeah, French Island. So anyway, the names aren't important, but we do use biomass for energy. Um, and so this is to create electricity as well as heat um, for uh, steam and it's just, it is a good use, but especially for our residues. So bark, um, it's hard. Landscape markets, nobody does landscaping in the wintertime. And so, but we still have sawmills and pulp mills that are generating this bark product uh, that can't be used uh, for a lot of things. So biomass is important. Kind of moving on to firewood. So we've got hundreds of local people that produce firewood and use firewood. Um, the Department of Ag Trade and Consumer Protection has 35 certified producers. Um, and uh, so what are the typical uses? We've got three categories of firewood. So residential heating, uh, that's those stoves have come a long way and they're very clean, clean burning and efficient. And so that's a great use for wood in Wisconsin. Um, recreational, if we've ever been camping, uh, recreational firewood is a big market and camping wouldn't be camping without firewood. So that's pretty exciting. Um, and then lastly, culinary. So I use Famous Dave's, Famous Dave's as an example, uh, but there's a lot of people that use um, wood for cooking as well. And especially in other parts of the world, uh, my advisor in graduate school told me that over half the wood in the world that's consumed is burned for either heat or energy. And we think, we don't necessarily realize that because of our fossil fuel reserve here in, in the US, and what we have, but when you go to other developing nations across the world, um, it's an important use for heat, especially, um, as well as cooking. So firewood is a good thing and we should celebrate that. 
next, uh, we're going to talk about engineered wood. So engineered wood can be like OSB or oriented strand board. Um, these are wood composites where uh, we're able to, to take wood and break it down into smaller components and then build bigger things. So we'll talk about a couple of cool examples in the state that we have. The first would be Louisiana Pacific or LP. Um, they've got two composite mills in the state. Um, so they would make OSB, but then also uh, a product called SmartSide. And so they've got a facility in Hayward and then a facility in Tomahawk. And what's cool about SmartSide is it's a, it's a wood product um, that can be used instead of say vinyl siding or cement board siding. So we are, when we put SmartSide on our houses, you're using Wisconsin forestry um, and strengthening our forest products economy here in the state and supporting sustainable forestry, which we'll get to. Um, so that's awesome. And another composite mill would be Marshfield Door System. So if you've ever, I know it's probably been a while since folks have been to a hotel, uh, but those types of doors um, made in Wisconsin. So this is an area we see potential growth. And again, there's a lot of engineers and science and testing that's been done. One product, um, called medium density fiberboard or MDF is a growing engineered wood as well. Um, so it's kind of a cross between sawdust and pulp and they mix some resins and they uh, with a lot of heat and pressure uh, can make sheets of what's called again MDF. And that's what's used to make for instance, Ikea furniture um, and other kind of painted products typically. But so that's a great wood product um, as well as cross laminated timbers or CLT panels. Um, CLT panels, it's kind of like plywood, but instead of really thin veneers that are, are made to make layers and then a four by eight sheet, you take two by fours and two by sixes and you lay them together uh, to make panels that are eight feet wide and 50 feet long. And you can build skyscrapers out of them. And this is a really exciting advancing technology. Um, and our final current event to bring up here is we actually have the world's tallest CLT building being built in Milwaukee right now. And it's called the Ascent Building. Um, and again, this is gonna be the world's tallest wood building, um, 25 stories tall and 284 feet total. And this is really exciting from being able to tap into new markets. Um, cross laminated timber is, is new to the US, um, but it's been used in Europe for over 20 years. Um, and again, U.S. has been slower to adopt, more so in the, it's been more commonly adopted out in the Pacific Northwest, uh, where they have more softwood as well as the Southeast. Um, but this is really exciting. And maybe a question to pose to students in your class, if you do choose to look up this current event, um, what's the impact of building skyscrapers out of wood? There's a lot um, when it comes to storing carbon and lighter buildings, um, and then, Kind of another really cool one is, well, from a market standpoint, um, wood is typically only used in residential construction. Um, and so to be able to enter a commercial buildings market through wood, that will use a lot of wood and help to stabilize uh, wood markets across the country. So a uh, fascinating question to dive into. Um, if folks are, if we have time, I know I'll try and keep her moving at the end to discuss some of those uh, impacts, but another one, so I, I'm going, I'm a wood nerd, um, full disclosure. And so when we see trees shaking in the wind, does it hurt their uh, structural strength? Maybe if it's very, very excessive, but for the most part, wood has that inherent flexibility and still can keep its strength. So when we look at say seismic activity or earthquakes in California and the West Coast there, um, those buildings, if they're made out of wood instead of a more brittle or rigid material, like concrete, are able to, to take some shaking and then also still be able to be structurally sound. Another big question is with fire. So we worry about, you know, oh, it's a wood building, it's going to burn down. Well, actually what happens, it's kind of like, and there's been a lot of testing that's been done at the Forest Products Lab in Madison, um, but basically the wood will char. So the building's not going to burn down, the outside the exposed wood will char and then uh, it keeps the wood strength for longer than in other building material. So I'm, again, I'm kind of a wood nerd. We could talk all day about CLT, but just know that this is a current event um, and exciting to along. Hey, Logan, before you move away from that, uh, we have a question about, do you see in the future CLT being made from trees in Wisconsin? That's a great question. And I think 
Uh, for right now, Wisconsin's forest resource isn't as heavy to softwood as other parts of the country. Um, so there's testing being done if we can use hardwood uh, tree species that we have. Um, red pine would be one that would, would fit pretty easily. Um, and, and there has been testing for white pine and hemlock out in the or northeast. Uh, so eventually I think we'll get there, but for right now it's probably going to use more traditional softwood species from uh, either Pacific Northwest or Southern Yellow Pine uh, for right now. But that's still exciting. We're using wood and that's good. So I hope that kind of answered the question and feel free to bring it up again if, if you have, if I can elaborate more. Um, so kind of moving on, another engineered wood that we don't necessarily think about uh, is veneer mills for making plywood. And that's an engineered wood product. Um, we've got five in the state um, all across. There's, I, I think, I don't know, I saw in the registration, someone was from Marion, Wisconsin. And uh, Great Lakes Veneer is out of Marion. So really cool uh, just to see that veneer takes a really high quality log. Um, and we use it to make those really thin, so you can kind of see this, it's very thin uh, and it's unrolled like toilet paper. If you, if you look up a YouTube video, uh, that would be a really cool one to see how it's spun on a lathe um, and we produce veneer. So we'll kind of keep moving on here. Uh, softwood lumber, we've got three really big softwood lumber uh, mills in the state. Again, this is making two by fours or two by sixes, more construction and dimensional lumber. Uh, and so Buer lumber, who call lumber, uh, up in Arbor Vitae. Um, but if you see select cut in Menards, um, that would be Buer's brand. Um, so it's kind of a really cool to know that, that that lumber is coming from our mills in Wisconsin and our uh, our trees. So two by fours don't come from the store. They come from trees that grow in forests. I had to put that line in there. Um, but then we also have a lot of other smaller local players um, that are producing, again, that dimensional two by four, two by six material as well. So hardwood lumber, this is probably my, my strongest background and, and one that I really get excited. It's our most common type of forest products business, um, primary uh, business in the state. Um, so we've got two types we'll talk touch on. It's called bolt mills. There's got 15 to 20 of those in the state. Um, and bolts are gonna be smaller than a, a full saw log and um, choose to make pallet parts. And we'll go into that a little bit. And then grade mills. Um, grade mills are our most common and they make what's called grade lumber. And we'll dive into what grade lumber is. So bolt mills, what happens is they've got a smaller log. And so you have to process it quickly um, and as least expensive as possible. So they do it in really rapid assembly line type ma manufacturing. So this is called a scrag mill. And you can kind of see there's two saw blades here um, and it's meant to cut two sides of that little log off and pop at, at once. Um, and then that gets passed, they square up the bottom and then it goes through what's called a resaw. Um, and you cut all the boards for a pallet in one pass or two passes, um, whether it's the deck boards or the stringers. And so we won't dive into that too much, but we do have, uh, like I said, a handful, 15 to 20 or so companies that are really uh, specialized in high production making parts for pallets, which a lot are easy. Um, and then next is the grade mill. So when we say grade, uh, they make different grades of quality lumber. So grade refers to the percentage that's clear. So our A grade board is say 80% clear. And then our B grade board would be between 80 and 70. Um, so that's just, it's a little more complicated than that, but for this talk, we'll go into that a little later. But then they also take those saw logs and they have residuals, so chips, like we talked about, that are either uh, pulped to make uh, paper or else burn for energy or landscaping. Um, and then industrial products. So the very center of the log has the most defects. And so we make railroad ties or pallet cans um, that kind of use that middle defect core. But what I really want to dive into is what this uh, grade lumber products are. So grade lumber is different from dimensional lumber in that it doesn't come in standard widths. Um, it's saw however wide the boards come from the log. So if we have a really big log, we'll have wider boards. Um, and it's used to make the appearance product. So 
Dimension lumber is used for studs in our houses and structural applications uh, where you don't see it. For grade lumber, it's used in things that we do see. So for instance, trim around doors and windows. Uh, that uses a really high grade or quality piece of wood uh, with very few defects because you need this long clear portion to go um, around the door. So, but then we use it for furniture would be our grade lumber. So we would use a high clear grade boards for our tops and then a lower grade board for our legs and the smaller components. Same thing with kitchen cabinets um, or our furniture. You know, when we have a, a chair, we don't need an eight foot clear board to make this chair leg uh, like we do for the door. So we can use a lower grade board that has uh, a lower percentage of clear wood and more defects. And then flooring, that's another really good example. So, but before, I guess, are there any questions on what grade lumber is? I know I'm kind of cruising along here, but I just wanna show the diversity and that we, we use it for a lot of different things that we see in our houses. Before we can make finished products though, the lumber needs to be dried in what's called a concentration yard or a kiln. Um, and so the wood is stacked under roofs and it had, allows for the wind to, to wick away the moisture. And by drying the lumber, it becomes more stable and we can use it for other things. Um, and so we can use it for that internal uh, inside for furniture and flooring and cabinets, et cetera. So, and then we can also ship it. So what's really cool is our lumber gets shipped all over the world um, to different end manufacturers. So we have a lot in the state from the kind of mom and pop cabinet shops or perhaps our local high school career and tech ed um, facilities, but then also industrial furniture plants um, or windows and doors. So Ashley Furniture over in Arcadia. And uh, so these people use a lot of wood and it comes from our trees. So. Uh, and then it can go all over the world, so, which is really exciting. Just some other big uses. Uh, we've got uh, railroad ties. Um, there's a couple plants in the state that are, are treating ties for our rail infrastructure. And then also semi-trailers. The flooring in there is uh, a really important lower grade market of wood. And then finally, some specialty mills. So utility poles, we've got some utility pole manufacturers in the state. Up here is a post sealing machine. So making fence posts out of wood. Um, these are barrel staves. So for aging whiskey and wine um, in wooden barrels, that's made out of white oak, really cool product. Um, this is Excelsior. Excelsior is, uh, I think of it as the environmentally friendly packaging peanut or it was environmentally friendly long before packaging peanuts, but uh, it was typically a medium for shipping to make sure fragile items don't break. This was decorative products. So this, you know, we use wood in a lot of different aspects that we don't necessarily think about all the time. So I know that was a lot of forest products and I apologize for rushing this, um, but we'll kind of keep moving into some key messages about forest products to take home to students and to others that we talk about. The first is that using forest products is essential to sustainable forest management. This using component is so important. Um, by harvesting trees, we are improving the health of our forests for the future. So we take out the diseased and dying trees that are, that are struggling or over mature. Um, and then that creates the space and light needed for new healthy forests to come growing back. But if we don't use them, there's no incentive to harvest those. So we have to use the trees that we harvest when we grow. Um, for markets, if we can't, utilize those trees, then we have poor markets, then we have what's called deforestation or land use changes. So instead of a new forest coming back, it will become an agricultural field or a solar panel field or other uses for our land that we don't have. So we know all the benefits forests provide and we need strong markets to keep forests on the landscape. Um, and just to emphasize that we do really great forestry in Wisconsin. There are more acres of FSC or uh, certified forest. So that's the logo you would see on like a coffee cup sometimes or other products, notebooks. Um, we have more acres of FSC certified forests in Wisconsin than in any other state in the country. And you can click that link there when we share the PowerPoint with everybody. Um, so just reemphasize, this is one point of many that we do excellent forest management and we grow more trees than we harvest in Wisconsin. So 
So that's first message is using force products to defend. The next is for many people, especially in rural areas, the forest products industry is their ticket to the middle class. This is really important. We have over 60,000 people employed by the forest products industry, and it is really the economic engine and driver in many, many rural areas. Um, the forest products industry is the leading employer in seven Wisconsin counties and a top five employer in 20 Wisconsin counties. Um, this is on our DNR webpage look up and it's from the in-plan 2017 number. So really important that for many people, this industry is their ticket to the middle class um, and to be able to have a job where they live. And then finally, wood is the most environmentally friendly building material available. Um, wood is the only major building material that is completely renewable, it is completely recyclable, and it is completely biodegradable. Um, when you look at concrete and steel, sure, you might be able to recycle some of it. Um, is it renewable, is it biodegradable? No, so it's, it's truly an amazing material from buildings to packaging um, all throughout our lives. So the more wood we can use, the better. Um, and there's what's called a life cycle analysis um, that show wood uses, and this isn't, there's one source I cited here with Dovetail Partners, if you look up them or click on this link, uh, but there's many, many studies that show that wood continues to be the most environmentally friendly in the sense that it uses the least amount of carbon to harvest, manufacture, and dispose. Of. So those are our key messages. Again, we're kind of flying through them. If you have questions, let me know, but I just wanted to dive into some uh, just career resources that we've put together and, and have time to open it up for questions. Uh, so our program has put together a hardwood lumber industry curriculum so the idea is to help students and teachers better understand the hardwood lumber industry and as well as other industries, whether it's softwood lumber or uh, veneer or pulp and paper. We, we wanna continue to develop that so students can get better connected to the industry, um, the whole forest products industry. So we're starting with the hardwood lumber and we've developed a series of presentations as well as other materials available on a Google Drive that will be part of the, the new leaf forestry curriculum it will be linked into that so you can have access to it. Um, but it's really intended, again, to connect students and teachers to the industry so they can better understand how they have an impact on the industry and, and all the good things that industry provides. Um, so just this is an example of a slide. Uh, one of the activities is a sawmill map flow or flow map. And so the uh, idea is for students to, it's a really cool in-person activity with some posters around the room. Uh, but students will fill in, you know, what is the specific workstations that are in a mill from the different equipment to the jobs and what that job entails. So if I'm uh, operating a saw and a, a head saw at the sawmill, what am I doing? What is the purpose of this job? Um, and what is the input material coming into that workstation as well as the byproduct and output material? Going through? So it's a really exciting activity. Uh, I have done that with uh, students at three or four different schools, um, and it's really cool. But then there's other resources um, just for that first day on key terms, as well as uh, crossword puzzle and some other cool stuff. So for sure, check it out. Um, and then what I also did was created a YouTube video playlist. So if you are struggling in your career in tech ed class to come up with online virtual activities for your students, um, you can give them this link of YouTube videos and it showcases that whole presentation uh, as I would. It's broken down into four different short videos, um, and there's even a question, uh, a sheet of questions for students to be able to uh, follow along with. So that's a resource we're trying to put together to help out teachers. And then finally, the other one is uh, lumber grading. So I, I really lightly touched on that, um, but if you have uh, administration in your school that really wants you to emphasize applied math and critical thinking, as well as career skills, um, please send me an email and follow up with me. Um, right here, this is an example of a board uh, where um, a typical board, it's my uh, poor graphic design skills, but the idea is for students to be able to calculate using fractions, uh, the percentages that's clear on that board. Um, and grading truly is a beautiful process and it takes a sharp mind um, and it's a, a very in-demand skill set. I would compare a lumber grader to a welder. So we often think and revere welders uh, for their abilities to work with their hands and their head. Um, 
and they said amazing job in what they're doing. Lumber inspectors and lumber graders are doing the exact same as far as people don't necessarily understand all uh, that step in the process. So please follow up with me. Uh, we made a reduced um, kind of student absorbable uh, version of the industry skill set that I think will be really beneficial for a lot of students, especially because um, this is all about, again, connecting schools and students to their local industry. And there's a lot of industry support um, because there's a huge shortage of lumber graders um, and people with those skill sets in our industry that are trying to connect. So I see a orange dot. Um, oh, so yeah, um, with that, that's pretty much all I got. Uh, any final questions, uh, feel free to, uh, to shout them out there, uh, but do celebrate and enjoy Forest Products Week. Um, and I hope uh, I can be a resource for any and all of you uh, as you work on communicating the importance of this industry to students. So, sorry if I went over, I hope not, but uh, yeah, I can send it back to Gretchen or Open up Excellent. Questions. Thank you, Logan. I'll take it back for just a minute or two while people we do have. Um, do you mind? Yeah, sharing the screen back over yeah. on this end. Um, well, people, we do have a, a few or a question in the chat, but um, before we get to that, I also just wanted to um, mention while people are thinking of other questions they might want to ask uh, that we are having um, one of these uh, lecture series sessions happening each month. And so um, if you enjoy Logan today and want to come back to learn about some more about um, private forestry in November, um, public land forestry in uh, December, and then um, our forest inventory analysis in uh, January, those are all set up and ready to go. We are still working on other sessions for um, the rest of this spring, um, those are in the process of being planned at this moment. And I think we, we do have or confirmation all the way out to May. Uh, so if you want to think that far ahead when we're already past uh, the winter and the snow and things are blooming once again, uh, we'll be focusing on forest health in May with that one. So the other ones in between are still being planned. Uh, but with that, Logan, there was a question in the chat. And I'm looking to see where my chat went. So if somebody else can pull it up, I believe Carol had a question about if you are able to travel uh, to schools and present. Question is, are you available if cleared to come to school and do a 45 minute presentation in three cohorted classrooms? That was from Carol in Eagle River. Thank you very much for, for the question. And uh, right now with where we're at in uh, the DNR with our Badger Bounce Back plan, I'm not sure if we've got clearance. I don't believe we do for right now this semester, uh, but I'd be happy to work with you to do a virtual recording or we can, uh, yeah, definitely, uh, hopefully we can get in touch and, and work through what we can do. But right now we, we're not able to travel yet, unfortunately. I did write down your um, email address and I will be in contact with you because I think we can do something virtually and I, I love the math connection. Um, SOAR fits in real well with this. So thank you. Thank you. Well, Logan, this is just um, Kate again, but I, awesome job, like really good job. And then I was wondering about packaging and what you think it looks like with, it seems like people are packaging more goods in COVID and is Wisconsin responding? Yeah, I, I guess maybe to break that out a little bit, when you say Wisconsin is responding as far as our paper mills still go, going or? Um, Oh, yeah, I think our paper mill is still going. Yes, that's probably true. But like, how are they being innovative in packaging? Yeah, so I, I would say that what we've seen is, is companies that can start to diversify and try to put in some packaging lines. Um, there are companies that, so we've got a white paper or graphic. White paper would be the broad name for that graphic and printing. 
Um, so we have seen companies that are putting investments into those packaging lines. Um, another big one is the recycled pulp um, and just understanding, you know, how are we able to maximize that recycle and reuse, uh, but we can only recycle wood fiber so many times before we need to bring in more virgin fiber into the process. And so uh, they're definitely trying to increase uh, yields and abilities there. Um, but I think another example would be nanocellulose. Um, so for those of us who haven't heard of that term before, um, basically we're able to take wood, park, uh, wood and break it down into really, really small properties, these nanofibers. Um, and then when we bring them back together, they have really cool properties. Um, they're as strong as steel and uh, yeah. So, and one of them is being able to make uh, kind of like a wax or a, a waterproof coating um, in the packaging line. So, and when we talk, the other thing about packaging is just from an environmental standpoint, uh, trying to be as sustainable as possible there. I think, yeah, there's definitely a lot. The paper bottles was a, was a big example. Um, from a new innovation. I hope that kind of answered the question. Yeah, totally. And I like your paper bottle innovation made me think of it. So mm -hmm. awesome. Good, other questions for Logan. We are coming upon the hour mark. So um, if you do need to leave, that's not a problem at all. But if you still have questions, Logan, are you available for a few minutes afterwards? Yeah, you bet. We I'm can stick on for as long as we need. Yep. Okay. Love to. <clears throat> Hi, Logan and Gretchen. Could I ask a question? Um, Certainly. I'm, I'm Jessica Tomaszewski. I'm the brand new um, utility vegetation management specialist in the Wisconsin Forestry Center that just got created last week. And uh, we were just tossing around the idea of celebrating forest products um, uh, on, in kind of featuring things. Are there um, specific celebrations that, um, your, that the DNR is doing for forest products that we should highlight? Um, you know, I don't know of any celebrations. They for sure have to be virtual. Um, right. But, uh, but yeah, I'm not aware of that right now, uh, but I can get back to you um, if that we do have anything going on. Jessica, we are awaiting a proclamation from the governor, so we'll be getting that and posting that online. Excellent, excellent. The other thing I wanted to mention, this is Kirsten with DNR Forestry, is that during Forest Products Week on the 21st, we're doing a virtual premiere of a two-part television series called America's Forest with Chuck Lavelle. And we'll have information coming out about that in the October issue of the leaflet um, that will be coming out next week. And so um, there will be a sign up link. We'll have a panel of experts talking about the forest resource and a link for you to get a sneak peek at those two television episodes. Logan, I have a quick question for you from the um, school forest aspect of things and the, the timber harvests that take place at school forests. I know with the Verso Mill closing, um, it the trickle down effect is also um, affecting some school forests that we're planning on harvesting timber this year. Um, is it, of course, all those educators are in contact with their, their DNR foresters, but um, just for general information, is it just basically a waiting game until we get those markets to open back up to kind of put those harvests on hold or is there another resource or option out there? That's a great question. And I think sometimes we forget, you know, when we do have these very uh, robust markets, sometimes we forget, well, what if we didn't have them until we, we don't have them? And so uh, to answer your question, I think hardwood pulp, that product from the forest is, is really an oversupply right now. And it's gonna take some time for markets to correct and, and get back to where they're at. But that Verso facility in Wisconsin Rapids consumes 25% of the hardwood pulp um, in the state. And so that was harvested in the state. And so when you think about just 
that extra supply of pulpwood, um, it's, it's going to be really difficult to sell pulpwood, um, especially if you're far away from markets. So that's kind of what we're seeing is, you know, other pulp mills don't have to reach out as far to get the supply they need. So if your school forest or county is kind of on the peripheral, um, it, it's going to be really difficult to sell that pulpwood just because they don't need it when they got closer supplies. Um, so I don't know if that really answered your question, but it's going to take some time. Um, and yeah, it's, it's tough because we've got to do what's right by the forest, um, but then we also have to do what's uh, economically feasible as well. No, that's really good information. And I think that a lot of it hasn't been coming up until we're at that point. And so I think it's good for people to start thinking that through and maybe getting those um, uh, harvests planned out a little bit better. And if you're thinking about something, making sure that you're in contact with your forester so that everything can get in place when the time is ready. Um, I think it was Mark, I'm, I'm sorry, I forgot to look to see what who the chat was from, but mentioned the Forest Product Services Lab or the U.S. Forest Products Lab, I'm sorry. Um, you want to give a, a mention about them and what they do? Yeah, you bet. And Kate, this, this really fits to your question as far as the innovation uh, in the packaging sector. Um, the U.S. Forest Products Lab is stationed out of Madison, and that is a nationwide research facility um, through the USDA that is purely focused on what is the, the most advancing um, and best use, highest best uses for our forests. And so the cellulose nanofibers um, and cellulosic technology was all developed there. Uh, it has since been really adopted by a lot of other state and institutions and universities and, and now the private sector uh, that has adapted those technologies and being able to, to commercialize those markets. So um, the Forest Products Lab invented cardboard um, and other cool packaging things. So it's, uh, it's really a, a unique resource we have here in Wisconsin, and I encourage anybody to go tour there uh, if you can, or if you're interested, shoot me an email and we can get contacted with, uh, with the folks down there uh, once COVID's done, obviously. But, um, but yeah, no, it's a, a great resource that we have in the state. They do a lot of CLT testing as well, so both fire and structural. Um, the hardwood, using hardwood species, that's where that testing gets done. I just want to say CLT is cross laminated timber, which is what people are using to do, do skyscape, skyscrapers. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's, that's exactly right. It's mind boggling, but think of it again. It's like, instead of plywood that's made out of thin veneers, we're talking entire walls and floors of buildings that are made out of two by six plywood, where each layer is a two by material. And so it, it is, it's really mind boggling. Um, there's a company called Smartland. Um, you can Google them, see what they're doing. Uh, and then TED Talks, if anybody's a fan of TED Talks, uh, cross laminated timber, there's a ton of good ones on them. So it's a new innovative product that's coming and it's gonna be awesome. I, I have another question. How would you get people excited? Like you talked about your FFA journey and kind of getting into forest products, but like, how would you get people excited? Cause like for me, I wouldn't be like, oh yes, I'm going to go into making paper. I think it all starts with the values of a healthy environment. So just understanding those multitude of benefits that forests provide. We talked about all the different ecosystem services from recreation, to wildlife habitat, clean air, clean water. Um, when you understand the bigger picture, and then for me, it was dialing into, hey, if we don't have strong markets um, and if we don't use our forest products, the health of our forests and all those other benefits uh, is at stake. So I, I would say just relating to the values that you know we care about, we all care about a healthy environment. We all want clean water and, and, and clean air to breathe when we can relate to those values and then tack on, hey, you know, this industry is keeping that side of the pillar together, keeping that pillar supported. So always relate to values. That's kind of what I try to, try to do. And as consumers, you know, I think that, again, the paper bottle example is really textbook. 
Uh, you know, we as consumers want to see sustainable options and, and wood will win that. Sorry to cut you off there. Oh, like, thank you for that answer. It was awesome. Any other questions out there? Alrighty, well then maybe we'll look to wrap things up. Thank you so much, Logan, uh, for your time today and the effort uh, that you put into that and all of the fantastic information you delivered. Um, I, I love it when I log in and learn as well. So um, that's, it's fantastic information. Uh, and if uh, anybody still um, needs uh, Logan's information, it should be up there. Um, hopefully you've been able to have a chance to write it down. Uh, I, I think he welcomes questions. And uh, if you ever have questions or need help again with forestry education, our information is there for LEAF as well, or we can connect you with Logan too. So with that, any last uh, comments before we sign off? I would just like to say thank you again to, to, to you and everyone for your time. This has been a lot of fun for me and I'm happy, again, any way I can be of help with uh, going forward, just let me know. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Take care.